At all times, tracks, trail and highways served humanity as keys to evolution. Empires and civilizations disappeared, centuries-old dust swept capitals and cities. But roads kept on breathing life back into them. We go on the Treasures of the Nation expedition to reveal facts about life at the crossroads of antiquity. Modern motorways are very much new, but if a trail is left, it will surely be found even thousands of years later. In this episode, why the Avarian Kagan needed an elephant, where in Hungary a camp of real step knights is located, what is the link between the Hussars and the descendants of Hungarian Kipchaks? Hungary, the most western point of the Great Steppe. Although in many respects, its history is similar to that of any other steppe nation, there are many unique things that one can encounter following the paths paved by the Megya soldiers. Венгрия отличается в первую очередь First of all, Hungary is unique due to its language, the origins of which are still in the center of scientific debate and is among the 10 most difficult languages in the world. Second of all, the country has 22 wine regions and the biggest in Europe freshwater lake, Lake Balaton. The Hungarians invented the ball pen, vitamin C, the hologram, the Rubik's cube and the computer. Yet the most important thing about the Hungarians is that they still remember that their ancestors came from the Great Stamp. Look how gorgeous is the sacred Danube. For thousands of years, generations of nomads of the Great Steppe, Scythians, Huns, Kipchak, Mongols and others wash their hands in its waters. Today, the Magyars are the keepers of the sacred Danube. Talking about Hungary, they first of all referred to the Huns and the Kipchaks. Here in Hungary, many other nomads had lived and had left significant mark on the history of the country. Take the Avars, for instance. Avare. The Avars came to the territory of modern Hungary in 568. It was a rather fast invasion. It took only two years for the Avars to seize control of the whole Carpathian Basin. In those days, the Avarian Khaganate ruled the land from the Volga to the Danube. The Avars brought with them the yet unknown warfare tactics to Europe. The core of the Avarian army consisted of elite heavy cavalry. Another extremely important innovation that the Avars introduced was the stirrups. Being on horseback and rising on stirrups at full tilt, the Avars skillfully used thin spears. That was an absolute military art breakthrough back then. In the course of 50 subsequent years, the Avars kept the Byzantine Empire under permanent pressure. 
They waged attacks on its lands and brought back huge volumes of trophies and tributes. A story describes the extent of the Avarian influence on the Carpathian region. Kagan Bayan, one of the famous Avarian governors, heard about the existence of elephants and ordered the then Byzantine emperor to deliver one to his quarters. The Byzantines got the elephant and drove it for a long time and with great effort to Kagan Bayan's palace. Having seen the elephant, the Kagan waved his hand indifferently and said, I don't need this animal, take it back. Despite the strong presence and impact of the Avars and other nomads in the region, Hungarians called themselves the Magyars and their country Magyar or Sark or the land of the Magyars. Why? Hungarians came here in 895, although they were present on this territory in small groups starting the mid 9th century and fought together with the Franks or the Moravian state. Already by the end of the 9th century, we can talk about full scale settling of the Magyars in the Carpathian Basin. In our historical sources, this period is referred to as Konfoglala, which means the attainment of the homeland. Where the Magyars lived before is not known for sure. Allegedly, the Magyar Rathnos was born somewhere in southern Siberia. Magna Kungaria, which the researchers associate with the Ural Volga interfluv region, is considered the mythical ancestral home of the Magyar people. There, the Magyars most likely were a part of Turkic state associations like Bulgaria and Khazar Khanate. Weapons played a large role in the military progress of the Hungarians. Here we see the Magyar saber, bow elements and arrowheads. As any other nomads, the Magyars were mounted soldiers. Here we see some riding accessories that were key for the Magyars in their lifetime and therefore likewise accompanied them in the other world. What were the most exceptional achievements of the Magyars from the point of view of combat glory and military deeds? In Europe, the Hungarians were famous for many elements of their military art. For example, they could effectively shoot bows in backwards position at full tilt. The neighboring people could hardly grasp their warfare tactics. The Hungarian horsemen possessed the standard step set of combat skills and weapons that ensured glory to nomads across the whole great step. The so-called reflex bow provided high initial speed of arrow ejection. The tactics of false retreat, drawing into ambush and closing down of the enemy from flanks guaranteed their victory. The light and extremely mobile Megya cavalry performed unexpected and precise assaults on opponents. In its turn, the heavy, slow and clumsy European armies of that time had nothing to challenge it. It was not by accident that the most widespread prayer in European communities of those days was our Lord, save us from the Magyars. Hungary is the country of astonishing and pacifying natural beauty. Who would have thought that amidst this silence and grace, a master as if having materialized from the ancient stamp legends is training soldiers in a small, remote Hungarian village of Kampashmura. Master готовит настоящих воинов.
I was six when I made my first bow. At that time, our father showed us how to make simple shooting tools. We used to just bend a willow rod and pull the bowstring. Since that time, I always had some type of weapon in my hands, be it a bow or a slingshot. Having turned 20, I got seriously engaged in making professional bows. Initially, I was rebuilding traditional Magyar bows. After that, I started making Hunnic, Bavarian and Mongolian bows. At 28, I became a real professional. After that, I started mustering horseback bow shooting. I had to learn it myself as before me, nobody did it. I designed such a thorough training program that now it has become a separate type of sport. We, the Hungarians, had arrived here from Asia on horseback with bows in our hands. I want to show you the level of our shooting skills astride a horse. We still have it somewhere deep in our hearts. When I just started, a lot of people supported me. Everybody you see here, we are all searching for the link with our ancestors. <laughs> I have had thousands and thousands of students. It's hard for me to give you an exact figure as I teach not only in Hungary, but also beyond its borders, in China, Canada and the US. Right now there are 200 officially registered students in my school. The group in front of you are beginners. Why do they do it? Why would modern people with cars, computers and everything want to learn bow shooting and horse riding? Modern people forgot how to communicate with the nature. This is wrong. We originated from the nature and shouldn't lose this link. Through shooting, I'm discovering myself. Through the horse, I'm discovering the outside world. My ancestors were the Scythians and the Huns. I am a descendant of the Huns. To a large extent, the Magyar combat spirit was formed by the Great Steppe, and that couldn't fall into oblivion just like that. The Magyars were and still remain one of the most combative nations in Europe. The separate type of military forces, the Hussars created by the Magyars, is yet another fact proving that. The treasures of the nation as always got lucky. Not just a historian or even a military historian, but a real lieutenant colonel of the Hungarian army, Dr. Veszpromi Laszlo, director of the Hungarian Military and Historical Museum, agreed to tell us about the origins of Hussars. 
Dr. Vespermi, we heard that as a type of military forces, the Hussars appeared in Hungary, in Megya Rosak. How did it happen? In the 15th century, the threat of conquest by the Ottoman Empire came to Europe. And so the need of designing absolutely new cavalry methods capable of resisting the Asian cavalry techniques arose. For that task, absolutely new people were required and they came around. The Ottoman invasion to the Balkans generated huge flows of refugees, Serbians, Bulgars and others, many of whom already possessed different warfare experiences. Having combined these overseas recruits with the actual Hungarians, having armed and trained them based on Hungarian military tradition, King Matthias Korvin created an essentially new type of military forces, light cavalry capable of fighting according to the actual European and Oriental manner. Starting the second half of the 15th century, the Hussars became an integral part of the Hungarian army. In the 17th century, after the Battle of Mokachi, when the Hungarian kingdom fell and the Austro-Hungarian Empire emerged, the Hussars formed a part of regular imperial army. Since that very moment, the Hussars attracted the attention of European countries due to their mobility, bravery and cavalry skills. In addition to the beautiful uniform, what is so special about the Hussars? Why were they so different from other types of military forces? Firstly, of course, their tactics and weapons. Sabres, powder guns, etc. They were perfect for swift attacks and reconnaissance missions. Hussar-specific combat techniques were very much relevant within the framework of warfare at that time. As a result of unsuccessful revolt in Hungary against the Habsburger, many Hussars emigrated abroad. And that laid the foundation for the development of Hussar units across the whole Europe. The Hussars became so popular and the origins of this phenomenon were and continue to be so respected that, for instance, the lyrics of the French Hussar march are still in Hungarian. The Hungarians were always capable of surprising with their military art, be it the sudden attacks of unpredictable nomads or the dashing sorties of fearless hussars. Yet it was one specific exhibit of the 20th century in the Hungarian Military Museum that struck us most of all. Dr. Vespremi, we saw a tank called Turan in the museum that surprised us very much. Could you tell us something about it? Yes, indeed, we have a replica of this tank in the museum's exposition. It's located in a different hall. By the way, the name of the tank is closely linked with the Hungarian military tradition. After the defeat in the First World War, Hungary was prohibited to have heavy artillery and armored forces. To fill the gap in the beginning of World War II, Hungary launched the so-called Dior Rearmament Project, under which it was planned to purchase licenses for the production of tanks and artillery from third countries. From among the whole area of different options, the Hungarian engineers chose the Czech medium tank by Skoda. As to its name, the ideas about the ancient ancestral Megya homeland were gaining ground in Hungary of that time. That's how the name of the tank originated. In total, over 100 machines were produced and went to the Eastern Front. After the war, the survived tanks were taken by the Red Army and there is no further information about them. Yet, as you can see, we still have to run tank blueprints. Have a look. This is the first tank's modification of 1940 release, fitted with a 40 mm gun and 50 mm protection block in the tank's front. We even have more detailed tank's designs. Let me show them to you. Enclosed, there is a detailed description of the tank's parts and units. At times, the roads of war turn in an unpredictable way. 
it's so weird to realize that tanks carrying the Turkic name were fighting in the fields of the Second World War as if trying to get home to the east and to the open space of the Great Stamp. Unfortunately, today there is no information about the specific battles that they took part in and how good were their combat characteristics. Yet the tank had left a big footprint in the Megya military history. The glorious era of stamp soldiers came to an end. How do the descendants of the last nomadic wave, the Kipchaks, live in modern Hungary today? To find this out, we went to Kartag, a town in eastern Hungary inhabited mainly by the Kuns, the descendants of the Kipchak Khan Kotyan. We got lucky again and arrived right in the middle of a traditional cuisine festival of Kipchak Magyars. This festival is 20 years old. This year we have at least 15,000 participants. It's not just a festival of traditional food. We have a special best roasted mutton competition. The Kartag roast is unique because it is made from the whole lamb body, from head to tail. We start preparing for the festival in the spring. First of all, we need to choose the most suitable lamb. It shouldn't be too young or too old. Ideal age is four to six years. The chosen lamb doesn't graze after the selection to prevent the meat having the grass flavor and taste. There are many other secrets of a tasty roast. Meat roasting is an integral element of any group activity in the area, be it a funeral, a wedding, a graduation party or a birthday. The first question upon coming back from, say, a wedding is, how was the roast? Only after that they ask, and how was the bride? Are you a kun yourself? Absolutely. My last name is Churag, an old kun family. I'm a kun from both maternal and fraternal sides. Our kin is called Shari Kovac. They often tell me that I look like a Tatar woman. Look at my cheekbones and chin. As they say in Hungary, blood will never turn into water. Being at home, you perceive the flag as something ordinary and routine. Encountering the native Kazakhstan's flag somewhere far from home just fills you up with warmth and perhaps even confidence that a part of you also lives here. This feeling of being perceived as a brother of Tina is just amazing. Hello, 
Salamat Sizbe. Salamat Siz. Do you speak Kazakh? Of course. I'm a Kipchak. I studied in Kazgu in Almaty 20 years ago. I live in Almaty now. Nice to meet you. Almaty is a gorgeous city. <laughs> In principle, we cook the lamb's head the same as the Kazakhs. The only difference is that we cut it in half, add salt and spices to enrich the taste of the brain, then tie it back together and cook together with the rest of the meat. What do you think? It's delicious. Did you cook it yourself? Of course. Except the love of meat, what else do the Kazakhs and the Kuns have in common? There are differences and distinctions, no doubt. One thing that is the same for both is that the Kazakhs and the Kuns don't forget things, good or bad. Besides, family is very important for us. We can always count on each other irrespective of where we are in the world, and we can fight to the last gasp. The differences appeared with time, but in the past, for example, our horses were faster than these of the Mongols, right? In the heart of the festival, as if reminding that man can't live by bread alone but also needs spiritual food, there is a huge Kipchak Museum. Opened in 1906, it has exhibits from across the whole Kunshak steppe and raids about the origins and the history of the Kuns as well as their achievements in Hungary. A surprise was awaiting us here. Having come to the museum, we suddenly got an unexpected answer to our question about the Hussars. Here you see how the Kipchak moved from Mongolia through China, the territory of Kazakhstan and the Ukraine, and how they came to Hungary. The Kuns who live here today came specifically from central Kazakhstan. In the early 13th century, suffering from the blows of Mongolian cavalry, a part of the Kipchaks, headed by Khan Kotyan, was forced to flee from the Black Sea steppes to the territory of Hungary. In 1239, King Bela IV met the Kipchaks and allowed them to stay in his lands. This event is reflected in this sculpture composition located in the town of Katar. Over the figures of Bala and Kotyan, you can see the double-tailed lion. It symbolizes the bravery of the Hungarian Kipchaks. Here's the same lion on the belt buckle. It is the copy of the belt buckle we found at one of the excavations. Why is the Kipchak standing together with the Hussar here? By that we wanted to show the military valor and bravery of the Kuns and the Hussars. The Kuns always served in the Hungarian Royal Army. In the 18th century it turned into the Hussar Army. In other words, the Kuns or the Kipchaks comprised the core of first Hussar military units. No, not exactly like that. The initial Hussar units consisted of different ethnic groups. In the 17th, 18th centuries, when the actual Hungarian Hussars appeared, it was already much easier to build this school because the Kuns became a real good army, a true royal army. What is the role and value of the Kipchaks in the history of Magya military victories, in the history of their combat glory? They claim that the Kun Hussars were the bravest among all Hungarian Hussars. The Kuns represented the military force that the king could always count on. The ancient wars have faded away, but the descendants of the nomads continue to rest with all their heart in a Hussar way. The ancient war roads got replaced with tourist tracks which you can always follow to come to the hospitable country of Megya Rosak. I've seen times that you would not believe I've been down so low I could hardly breathe But then I found me an ocean of hope down at my feet and I would ride